and uh, I work for a private healthcare and social care consultancy. Uh, we have offices in Helsinki and in Stockholm in Sweden. I have a very uh, extensive background also working with the public sector and with the research sectors and the companies alike. Um, in this European project, um, well, actually, I'm just going to say a few words about my presentation first. Uh, I will just say a few words about the project itself. Then I'm going to discuss a little bit about the demand side instruments, the approach, and why we are here today. And uh, finally, a few words about the concrete instruments, the public procurement of innovation and the pre-commercial procurement. And after that, I hope you will join the discussion or even during my presentation because we are in Spain or Catalonia, not in Finland where everyone speaks and sits, or sits quiet. Okay? So please feel free to comment also during the presentation. And if I speak too fast or I'm not clear, please say that too. Okay. So the INSPIRE project, um, it's a two-year project where we're actually um, trying to uh, support European ac actors in our different regions, but also European-wide, to start become active in the scene of demand-side instruments, to start using public procurement and pre-commercial procurement as a driver for public sector change and also for economic growth and social benefits. We have the difference with maybe to some other European projects is that we actually have very capable experts in our project from different sectors and from different regions in Europe who have all been working for a long time with these issues. So we are not newcomers in the area. So I really hope you take a chance to talk to us later today um, in the afternoon sessions, for example. So we are trying to connect the actors in Europe uh, to also to pool demand on activities so that there will be some scalability and more interest for, for the companies to participate in the upcoming uh, procurements or pre-commercial procurements. And we are also sharing evidence on what has been already done uh, successfully in order to really give confidence and, and new ideas to everyone uh, interested. We have a website, uh, it's called the Inspire Academy, um, where you can actually find quite a lot of materials on these instruments and also see what is going on in different parts of Europe at the moment. So this is just to show you the, the website uh, itself and, and some idea what, what you can find there. Well, then, then we go to the, to, the, to the reason we are here today. And, and the first thing is that you might ask, at least those of you who have not been working with this instrument, what is the aim of, of demand-side instruments? Uh, well, European uh, Commission, as well as suppose national funding bodies and authorities have been spending throughout the years quite a lot of money on R&D uh, projects. But now it's time to start thinking a bit differently in the R&D work. And, and the question is whether uh, the demand side actors like yourselves in, in the public, public uh, organizations in Catalonia can as demand side act actors become the drivers of this innovation, innova innovative activities. So it should not just be a, uh, technology, technology or research push like often has been until nowadays. I'm not saying always, but very often. And why should we be a demand side focus? Well, actually there are, even if you don't maybe believe, there are studies done. It shows that it actually pays off if the demand side becomes more active. Uh, also in comparison to the traditional R&D activities. You have very nice and good examples, for example, from the US, also from the Netherlands, where these kind of activities have been successful um, in different ways. Also in the sense that actually we have gotten new innovations uh, deployed in the services and have been commercialized, not only developed. And like I said, uh, European and national bodies have started funding these kind of activities in the past years and, and there is all the time more money and activity going into this. So you should take the opportunity. Well, if you do this, what is needed and what pays off? I think one of the main thing is that you just cannot think about it as regular R&D activity or regular procurement, 
But since you do invest in time and effort in doing these kind of new kinds of activities in co-creation or collaborative manner with the companies or the end users, you really need to think how it pays off. And the only way really to think about it is to, to approach it from the economic argument side and make sure that in the public sector also you start thinking about business models, service models, how you're actually going to conduct the whole exercise in a way that you get something tangible out of the thing. And what I'm saying here is that, uh, well, the words can be discussed, but basically I think the public sector, when launching uh, innovative activities and procurement activities, they should, from the start, not during or after, but from the early start, think about the business or service model they are creating. Think about the objectives, think about the metrics, and think about who is going to profit from that. And if you do that from the very start, and also use it as a tool throughout the whole process, you have much more chances of being successful throughout the process, but also as an end result. And the end result in the most successful cases should, of course, be actually commercial procurement that is also deployed and taken into use in the public sector services, or possibly elsewhere even in private services. These are the four M's I often talk about. I'm not going to say much more about those now. We can discuss, I think, more in the afternoon session, but maybe just give you an overview of what kind of things uh, your organization and you personally need to think about when you start uh, working with the companies and end users in the very early phases of pre-procurement. Uh, and then a few words about the instruments. Well, the main, these are one of some of the main characteristics of PPI and PCP, the public procurement of innovation and the pre-commercial procurement. Firstly, like I said, it's really a need, a challenge-based approach. You are not asking the companies to tell you what you should procure. You should not procure what you're procuring now, but you should actually do a thorough work in defining the need and, and the challenge you are trying to a confront with the new solution or the R&D. You need to conduct um, discussions with the market and the end users to really define a working business model or service model, as I said before. And you do actually need to create specifications that focus on the functionality, value, and outcome, not so much of the concrete uh, product itself. I often use it as an example here um, that you actually, when you want to cross a river, you normally procure a bridge maybe. Well, this time you don't procure a bridge. You procure a solution to cross the river, right? So this is a simple example of what we are doing and th discussing here today. Uh, Small text, um, you can look at this maybe later on, but this may basically have tried to put in a very small space the whole process of uh, innovative procurement process. If you look at the left side, uh, it starts with defining the strategical point of, in your organization. What kind of service strategy you have, what kind of e-health strategy you have, what kind of maybe economic or social objectives you have in your organization. And that is the starting point of PPI and PCP. The second step is that when you have done that uh, and you know that you have the mandate to do things differently, you start doing the needs assessment in your organization. For example, in the hospital with the clinicians in a very uh, close connection to really understand what are the real needs, what works, what does not, what, does, what exists already, and what is feasible to, to approach in a new way. Then you conduct the dialogue with the market and also and, and, and with the end users, for example, the patients in this case, you try, if you're acquiring a new mobile health solution, if you really want to know that it will actually work also for the pa patients, you need to somehow have some understanding of that side as well. So it's about uh, co-creating also with the end users. And that brings empowerment, inclusion, more certainty that the solution will actually be used when procured uh, through commercial procurement and taken into use. And finally, when you have done all that and you are sure you want to continue, you have to do the design, the strategy, and the competition you're going to do. 
And if you are in a situation where you already now understand that there is a solution on the market, or there is likely to be a solution on the market very soon, based on the exercise you have done in the pre-phase, well, then, then you proc do an innovative procurement. It's a commercial procurement with specifications that drive innovation maybe in a new, new different way. So it's, it's not that different from a commercial procurement, it's different in the sense that you have done a thorough pre-exercise to understand what you really want to procure and the specifications might be innovative compared to a regular procurement. But if you're not finding any solutions, you don't think there will be one tomorrow or in the coming months, then you actually choose as an instrument the pre-commercial procurement, the procurement of R&D services. And that's a completely different story. I'm not going to tr go through this uh, more thoroughly here, but here you see the framework from European Commission. You might be familiar with it already. Uh, the basic thing, well, actually, and, and in the, in the, on the far left side in phase zero, that is all the part which I already discussed in my previous slides. So all that is in the zero phase. And, and, and after having you done that and you decided that you launch a PCP, then you have the call for tender, PCP call for tender. And, and uh, what is characteristics for PCP is that it's not law, it's not hard law. It's a recommendation from the European Commission. So the, the exercise and the instrument is not... Um, it does, the, 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 commercial, the, the law doesn't, the procurement law does not imply. So actually, you just have to respect normal um, contractual law, transparency, and other kind of things you do even normally in your activities. The, the main thing is it, that it is a competitive framework. So you have to award the, the award, uh, give the award to multiple companies. And, and, and you do it a stepwise, stepwise process where you actually eliminate companies uh, throughout the process and you probably end up then in the end with one or two or three maximum that are the best ones. The IPRs are shared, so actually uh, the company has possibility to exploit their understanding on other markets and also the public sector has the possibility to use the IPRs um, in their activities. So, I think this was my presentation, since I see the last slide already here. Uh, um, I think, yeah, it would be, well, this, this is from my point of view, really, what it is all about. Um, you just start, have to start thinking differently, and you have to see that there are different actors that have different opinions, and if you're successful in aligning these opinions and bringing all, everyone together to do things differently, then it probably will work, okay? Thank you very much, and I'm very happy and open for any questions. Thank you.